Hello everyone, we're on to our last lesson of this topic, so it's B17.4, Rates of Decomposition. So your objectives for this lesson are to describe three key factors that affect the rate of decay, link these factors to why they affect the rate of decay, and explain how compost and biogas are made. So I'd like you to write down the title, date and objectives, and then complete the quick task. Which processes put carbon into the atmosphere? Which processes, which process takes carbon out of the atmosphere? So you need to look back to last lesson if you get stuck. So pause the video, title, date and objectives, and complete the quick task. Okay, here are your answers to the quick task. Um, processes that add carbon to the atmosphere are respiration, combustion, decay, and volcanic eruptions. And the process that removes carbon from the atmosphere is photosynthesis. Generally speaking, at Key Stage 4, they don't really talk as much about volcanic eruptions. So it's, it's still correct, but you might not really need to mention it. The um, other processes, like respiration and decay, are natural processes, so they're fine in photosynthesis is a natural process. The problem is combustion. We are burning too many fossil fuels and adding too much carbon to the atmosphere. If you remember all that and it all makes sense, that's great. If not, you might need to revise the carbon cycle again. Okay, so here's your starter task. If you're watching the video with someone, you can discuss it. If you're on your own, you can either just think about it or write a couple of bullet points yourself if you want to as well. So which piece of quiche is going to go bad first? Which one will go bad last? We've got slice A, which has been left out on the worktop uncovered. We've got quiche B, which is in cling film. It's going to go in the fridge. And we've got quiche C, left out on the worktop, but wrapped in cling film. Okay, so here are your answers. Quiche A has been left on the worktop without any covering on it. Now it's warm in the kitchen, It's there's lots of oxygen available because it's not been covered, and also there's moisture available because the quiche is moist. So all these things are good conditions for decomposers to be working. So actually that quiche is gonna go bad first. Um, the second one to go bad would be quiche C, which has been left out on the worktop, but wrapped in cling film. Now it's still in those warm conditions. There's a bit less oxygen because it's wrapped in cling film. There's not as much oxygen getting in and out. There's only the oxygen that's already in there. And but there's still the available moisture. And um, the third one to go off will be quiche B, which is wrapped in cling film. It's going in the fridge. It's probably okay for about three days or so. Um, it's cold in the fridge. There's less oxygen again because it's wrapped up. And um, there's less, uh, there is available moisture there. So all three have available moisture. So my next question is, pretty obvious one, how can I make my quiche last even longer? And as I'm sure you've guessed, it's by putting it in the freezer. So the freezer is very, very cold. There's no moisture available if something's frozen because the liquid moisture is turned to ice. Now, microbes need liquid moisture in order to be able to respire. And there's also very little oxygen available because if I've shut the freezer door and it's very cold and I've wrapped it in cling film, there's going to be a lot less oxygen because there's nothing, no air going in and out of the freezer. The freezer is airtight. OK, so... Considering those things, what I'd like to do is have a go at answering these questions. Question one, what is a decomposer? You should remember this from previous lessons. Question two, how do the following affect the rate of decay? Temperature, moisture, oxygen. And if you get stuck, log on to Caboodle, open the Digital Biology GCSE AQA book, and there's some work on page 282 that will be able to help you answer these questions. So pause the video, complete the questions. And here are the answers to your quick questions. I would like you to mark in green pen or correct your work in green pen. So what is a decomposer? A microorganism that feeds on dead animals and biological waste. Question two, how do the following affect the rate of decay? Temperature, if it's too cold, that slows decay. If it's too hot, that kills microorganisms. So if you heat, ideally when you're cooking things and heating things, you're, most things you're looking to get it to about 100 degrees Celsius, that'll kill most microbes um, because the enzymes inside them get denatured and can't work anymore and then they die. 
Um, warm conditions between 30 to 40 degrees Celsius are ideal for decay. And again, that links back to enzymes. So the enzyme activity inside all living things works best at around 30 to 40 degrees um, because that's the rate at which you've got more collisions, um, successful collisions occurring between the enzyme and substrate. And um, also, um, it's not too hot like where the, the enzymes are going to get denatured. So that's the ideal temperature. If you can't recall that information about enzymes, you probably need to do a bit a revision of B3 where you learn about digestion and digestive enzymes. So if you can't remember what I've just talked about about enzymes, do a bit of B3 revision. Okay, the next thing is moisture. So if it's too dry, that slows the rate of decay and also it can mean that the um, microorganisms dry out or desiccate. But if it's nice and moist, there's plenty of water available, that increases the rate of, de of decay. Lastly, oxygen. Most decomposers need oxygen to respire aerobically, so the presence of oxygen increases the rate of decay. Microorganisms can decompose things um, by respiring anaerobically, which means without oxygen, but that just takes a bit longer, so actually having oxygen speeds it up. Okay, you might remember this picture of where one of my kids' books from, um, I think it was Lesson 17.2, which is about decay. So we can see the inside of um, a compost heap, and we've got all the food and kitchen scraps up at this level. And as you go down, you can see that the decomposition is um, happening over time, because this, this would be where the lowest layer is. The, the first things you put in will be at the bottom, won't they? And we um, make compost to enable plants to grow. And um, compost heaps, usually you take what you want from the bottom when you're ready to use it on your plants. Now, the decomposers can respire faster and more effectively in oxygenated, warm, moist conditions. So let's say you've got compost heap in your back garden, how are you going to make composting faster? Pause the video, write three bullet points to say how you're going to make that composting process faster. The answers, actually, one of it's kind of given to you. So if compost heaps have worms in them, as the worms move through the compost heap, they make these little tunnels and little gaps and this actually allows air to flow through the compost heap. So having lots of worms in your compost heap is good. Um, having it warm is a good thing. So sometimes um, you um, can have on, on a large industrial scale when compost is made, you can kick start the process by warming it up. But then as long as it's insulated, the process of respiration releases heat in itself. So once you kick started it, it then keeps itself warm because um, um, respiration is exothermic. It gives off heat. And um, lastly, moist conditions. Well, actually, again, you might want to add moisture to your compost heap if it's getting dry. Um, another thing to consider with the temperature, maybe you would have it in a sunnier or warmer spot of your garden. If you're, because I just mentioned on an industrial scale, but actually, if we're talking in terms of just like what's in your garden, you might want to have it in a spot that's not like particularly cold or shady. You might want to have it in an area where it gets plenty of warm sunlight during the day. Um, another way of oxygenating it is quite simply turning it over. So what you can do is get a pitchfork, stand on top of your compost heap, dig your pitchfork in and just lift up massive clumps of compost, turn it over, give it lots of air, and that brings air into the compost heap. Just like, imagine if you're whisking up egg whites or whisking up like cream to make it light and fluffy, that's because you're adding air to the mixture. So that's what you would be doing with your compost heap if you had a pitchfork. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is biogas. So biogas is produced um, under anaerobic conditions. And what happens is the waste from animals on farms, so horses, chickens and cows, their manure, their poo is collected, um, usually mixed with a fair bit of water. And it goes into, this is a biogas fermenter and it's an industrial scale one. So in this particular diagram, which I've taken from an exam paper, the manure, manure goes in along with the water. So it can't just be dry manure or else the stirrer would, would get jammed. Um, and the heating coil helps to keep the conditions warm. So here's the heating coil. So it's like um, heating it up to about 30 degrees Celsius, which is the best temperature for anaerobic respiration to occur. And as you can see, this is happening in a sealed container. So there is nowhere for air to get in. This container is completely sealed. And normally, if you wanted air to get in, there might be some sort of gap here. But obviously, there isn't in this diagram. 
Now, what happens is the stirrer keeps things moving around so that you don't get clumps and so that the bacteria are sort of well distributed inside. And as we know, gas is less dense than liquid, so it all floats to the top. And that means it can come out of this pipe here. And lastly, any waste, any leftover manure that hasn't been fermented, anything we don't need, can come out here on the outflow. And that can be used for fertilizer as well. So that could be sprayed on crops or whatever and used um, to fertilize things. Now, these are very rough figures I've written at the side here um, because the actual amounts of methane, carbon dioxide and other gases that you get in biogas can fluctuate widely. But generally speaking, or roughly speaking, you're looking at the methane, this gas that comes out here. So here's the gas coming out. This gas is approximately 65% methane, which is um, what the microbes produce when they're respiring under anaerobic conditions. 30% carbon dioxide. So there will be some oxygen there. It won't be 100% air-free zone. So there will be some aerobic respiration going on. And carbon dioxide is given off. Um, and also carbon dioxide is given off under anaerobic respiration too, so there you go. And lastly, there'll be other gases, so water vapour, nitrogen, whatever else will be mixed up in there. Now, on a smaller scale, um, biogas is really useful. So, for example, um, I've taken this information from um, a website that's about um, making biogas in India. It's a really interesting website, and I do recommend going on it if you want to do a bit more learning about this. But um, when you've got small communities or farming communities in rural areas, what they can do is um, build their own um, biogas um, fermenter here. What happens is, is there's um, an inlet pipe here and they might have a farm with some cows and some plants and so forth. And when they are clearing the cow dung from the fields, they can just put that in here along with a bit of water. And there's a pipe that goes underground, taking it to this biogas fermenter. Um, as I've mentioned before, the gas is less dense, so it moves upwards. And there's actually just a single, there'll be a pipe coming out of here. That means that gas can be taken and that is just methane gas and used in stove burners. And that's really good because in a lot of rural places they use um, wood or kerosene fuel, which can be more polluting. And biogas is a much cleaner source of fuel. And any waste will come out of this area here and can be used as fertilizer for the crops. I also included this picture because it was really useful to actually see what it looks like in real life. So these men here are actually building their own community's um, biogas um, system. Um, this pipe here is where the waste will be um, put into. This chamber here is where the biogas um, will be um, produced. And then here is where you'll expect the fertilizer to come out. Eventually, they'll finish building this into a completely enclosed dome and cover it in concrete and then bury it underground. So it doesn't even, it's not even an eyesore. It doesn't take up any space. It's just there. And once it's done, it's done. OK, what I'd like you to do is um, write down these keynotes from this lesson, pause the video here, and then the answers will be on the next slide. OK, decomposers can break down kitchen and garden waste to make compost rich in minerals. With lots of oxygen present, the decomposers respire aerobically, which is faster than anaerobic respiration, and warms a compost as they respire. Moisture makes the process quicker too. When microbes respire anaerobically, or without oxygen, they produce flammable methane as a waste product. This biogas can be burned as a fuel or used to generate electricity. The optimum temperature for microbes making biogas is 30 degrees Celsius, and again, moisture is needed. OK, last time I gave you a little bit more of a tricky exam question, but I thought I'd be kind today and give you quite an easy one. So this one should be like really simple for you to complete. So um, just write down the answers to question A and B. Take some time to read through it. Pause the video here. And another easy one. Just write down the correct answer for part C. Pause the video here. OK, and here are your answers. Question A, the answer is either microorganisms or microbes or bacteria or fungi or decomposers. Any one of these 
words here would allow you one mark. They're not allowing germs because that's too much of a colloquial term and it can mean bacteria or viruses or protists or fungi. So it doesn't really count. Worms and other detritivores don't count as well because we're looking for decomposers here, not detritivores. Okay, question B, the answer is that it's warmer or hotter. As you know, it's um, going to, decay is going to occur faster in warm conditions. Um, and if you put anything about wetter, lighter or sunnier, that doesn't count. Because on sunny days in winter, it's actually not that warm because you don't get the same um, amount of infrared radiation coming from the sun. It's more spread out. Um, so um, they're not accepting those answers. And lastly, the answer was oxygen. So that's worth one mark as well. So write down how many marks you got out of three. Okay, so let's go back to our objectives. Can you describe three key factors that affect the rate of decay? Yes, sort of, or no. Can you link those factors to why they affect the rate of decay? If you're happy with that and confident, put a smiley face. Not so sure, put a middle face really unsure put a sad face and lastly can you explain how compost and biogas are made again self-assess yourself on your confidence there okay so here is some um, resources for further study and um, this link here um, as I mentioned before is, is the website that's all about um, how biogas producers are being used in rural areas of India and um, there's a very good BBC bite size page that I found that covers um, decay and the production of biogas and uh, compost now this is something I actually want you to do so please make sure that you have done this whether or not you feel confident decay, everyone needs to do this. So if you look up free science lessons require practical decay on YouTube, you will find that free science lesson. I want you to at least watch it, make sure that you're aware of what the dependent and independent variables are, how the experiment is being measured, what the outcomes are. Now, obviously this is a required practical, so we will be doing it when we return to school. But in terms of understanding it from the theory side, it's really useful for you to watch this video. Lastly, if there's anything else you're not sure about from this lesson, have a look at some of the other YouTube videos I've mentioned on previous um, videos. Um, so you can um, maybe look at Primrose Kitten, uh, the Amoeba Sisters, Free Science Lessons, whatever other resource you find useful. And lastly, again, for further study, look at page 282 and 283 of the AQA Biology book. Well done everyone, that is the topic B17 finished. We're going to do some revision and then there'll be a little assessment coming up. But that's it, one topic down and done dusted. Well done everyone, I'll see you again soon, bye.